pleased to present The Mysterious Affair at Styles by Agatha Christie, read by David Suchet. This is complete and unabridged, an audio edition's mystery master. Chapter 1. I Go to Styles. The intense interest aroused in the public by what was known at the time as the Styles case has now somewhat subsided. Nevertheless, in view of the worldwide notoriety which attended it, I have been asked both by my friend Poirot and the family themselves to write an account of the whole story. This, we trust, will effectually silence the sensational rumours which still persist. I will therefore briefly set down the circumstances which led to my being connected with the affair. I had been invalided home from the front, and after spending some months in a rather depressing convalescent home, was given a month's sick leave. Having no near relations or friends, I was trying to make up my mind what to do when I ran across John Cavendish. I had seen very little of him for some years. Indeed, I had never known him particularly well. He was a good fifteen years my senior, for one thing, though he hardly looked his forty-five years. As a boy, though, I had often stayed at Stiles, his mother's place in Essex. We had a good yarn about old times, and it ended in his inviting me down to Stiles to spend my leave there. The mater will be delighted to see you again after all those years, he added. Your mother keeps well? I asked. Oh, yes. I suppose you know that she is married again. I'm afraid I showed my surprise rather plainly. Mrs. Cavendish, who had married John's father when he was a widower with two sons, had been a handsome woman of middle age, as I remembered her. She certainly could not be a day less than seventy now. I recalled her as an energetic, autocratic personality, somewhat inclined to charitable and social notoriety, with a fondness for opening bazaars and playing the Lady Bountiful. She was a most generous woman, and possessed a considerable fortune of her own. Their country place, Styles Court, had been purchased by Mr. Cavendish early in their married life. He had been completely under his wife's ascendancy, so much so that on dying he left the place to her for her lifetime, as well as the larger part of his income, an arrangement that was distinctly unfair to his two sons. Their stepmother, however, had always been most generous to them. Indeed, they were so young at the time of their father's remarriage that they always thought of her as their own mother. Lawrence, the younger, had been a delicate youth. He had qualified as a doctor, but early relinquished the profession of medicine and lived at home while pursuing literary ambitions, though his verses never had any marked success. John practised for some time as a barrister, but had finally settled down to the more congenial life of a country squire. He had married two years ago and had taken his wife to live at Stiles, though I entertained a shrewd suspicion that he would have preferred his mother to increase his allowance, which would have enabled him to have a home of his own. Mrs. Cavendish, however, was a lady who liked to make her own plans and expected other people to fall in with them, and in this case she certainly had the whip hand, namely the purse strings. John noticed my surprise at the news of his mother's remarriage and smiled rather ruefully. "'Rotten little bounder, too,' he said savagely. I can tell you, Hastings, it's making life jolly difficult for us. As for Evie, oh, you remember Evie? No. Oh, well, I suppose she was after your time. She's the mater's factotum companion. Jack of all trades. A great sport, old Evie. <laughs> Not precisely young and beautiful, but as game as they make them. Um, you were going to say... Oh, yes, yeah, this fellow. He turned up from nowhere on the pretext of being a second cousin or something of Evie's, though she didn't seem particularly keen to acknowledge the relationship. The fellow is an absolute outsider. Anyone can see that. He's got a great black beard and wears patent leather boots in all weathers. But the mater cottoned to him at once, took him on as secretary. You know how she's always running a hundred societies. I nodded. Well, of course, the war has turned the hundreds into thousands. No doubt the fellow was very useful to her but you could have knocked us all down with a feather when three months ago she suddenly announced that she and Alfred were engaged. The fellow must be at least twenty years younger than she is. It's simply bare-faced fortune-hunting. But there you are. She is her own mistress, and she's married him. Oh, it must be a difficult situation for you all. Difficult? It's damnable. Thus it came about that three days later I descended from the train at Stile St. Mary, an absurd little station with no apparent reason for existence, perched up in the midst of green fields and country lanes. 
John Cavendish was waiting on the platform and piloted me out to the car. "'Got a drop or two of petrol still, you see,' he remarked, "'mainly owing to the mater's activities.' The village of Stiles St. Mary was situated about two miles from the little station, and Stiles Court lay a mile the other side of it. It was a still, warm day in early July. As one looked out over the flat Essex country, lying so green and peaceful under the afternoon sun, it seemed almost impossible to believe that not so very far away a great war was running its appointed course. I felt I had suddenly strayed into another world. As we turned in at the lodge gates, John said, "'I'm afraid you'll find it very quiet down here, Hastings.' "'Ha! <laughs> my dear fellow, that's just what I want.' "'Oh, well, well, it's pleasant enough if you want to lead the idle life. "'I drill with the volunteers twice a week and lend a hand at the farms. "'My wife works regularly on the land. "'She's up at five every morning to milk and keeps at it steadily until lunchtime. "'It's a jolly good life taking it all round, "'if it weren't for that fellow Alfred Inglethorpe.' He checked the car suddenly and glanced at his watch. "'I wonder if we've time to pick up Cynthia. Mm, "'No, she'll have started from the hospital by now. "'Cynthia, uh, that's not your wife?' "'No, Cynthia is a protégé of my mother's, "'the daughter of an old schoolfellow of hers, "'who married a rascally solicitor. "'He came a cropper, and the girl was left an orphan and penniless. "'My mother came to the rescue, "'and Cynthia has been with us nearly mm, two years now.' She works in the Red Cross Hospital at Tadminster, seven miles away. As he spoke the last words, we drew up in front of the fine old house. A lady in a stout tweed skirt who was bending over a flower bed straightened herself at our approach. Hello, Evie. Here's our wounded hero, Mr. Hastings, Miss Howard. Miss Howard shook hands with a hearty, almost painful grip. I had an impression of very blue eyes in a sunburnt face. She was a pleasant-looking woman of about forty, with a deep voice, almost manly in its stentorian tones, and had a large, sensible, square body with feet to match, these last encased in good, thick boots. Her conversation, I soon found, was couched in the telegraphic style. "'Weeds grow like house of fire. Can't keep even with them. Shall press you in. Better be careful.' "'Oh, I'm sure I shall be only too delighted to make myself useful,' I responded." "'Don't say it. Never does. Wish you hadn't later.' "'Oh, you're a cynic, Evie,' said John, laughing. "'Where's tea today? Inside or out?' "'Out. Too fine a day to be cooped up in the house.' "'Come on, then. You've done enough gardening for today. "'The labourer is worthy of his hire, you know. Come and be refreshed.' "'Well,' said Miss Howard, drawing off her gardening gloves, "'I'm inclined to agree with you.' She led the way round the house to where tea was spread under the shade of a large sycamore. A figure rose from one of the basket chairs and came a few steps to meet us. "'My wife, Hastings,' said John. I shall never forget my first sight of Mary Cavendish. Her tall, slender form outlined against the bright light, the vivid sense of slumbering fire that seemed to find expression only in those wonderful, tawny eyes of hers, remarkable eyes, different from any other woman's that I've ever known. The intense power of stillness she possessed, which nevertheless conveyed the impression of a wild, untamed spirit in an exquisitely civilized body. All these things are burnt into my memory. I shall never forget them. She greeted me with a few words of pleasant welcome in a low, clear voice, and I sank into a basket chair feeling distinctly glad that I had accepted John's invitation. Mrs. Cavendish gave me some tea and her few quiet remarks heightened my first impression of her as a thoroughly fascinating woman. An appreciative listener is always stimulating, and I described in a humorous manner certain incidents of my convalescent home in a way which, I flatter myself, greatly amused my hostess. John, of course, good fellow though he is, could hardly be called a brilliant conversationalist. At that moment, a well-remembered voice floated through the open French window near at hand. "'Then you'll write to the princess after tea, Alfred. "'I'll write to Lady Tadminster for the second day myself, "'or sh shall we wait until we hear from the princess? "'In case of a refusal, Lady Tadminster might open it the first day "'and Mrs Crosby the second. "'Oh, but then there's the Duchess, about the school fate.' "'There was the murmur of a man's voice, "'and then Mrs Inglethorpe's rose in reply. Y "'Yes, certainly. After tea will do quite well. "'You're so thoughtful, Alfred, dear.' The French windows swung open a little wider, 
and a handsome, white-haired old lady with a somewhat masterful cast of features stepped out of it onto the lawn. A man followed her, a suggestion of deference in his manner. Mrs. Inglethorpe greeted me with effusion. "'Why, if it isn't too delightful to see you again, Mr. Hastings, after all these years! Alfred, darling, Mr. Hastings! Mr. Hastings, my husband!' I looked with some curiosity at Alfred Darling. He certainly struck a rather alien note. I did not wonder at John objecting to his beard. It was one of the longest and blackest I've ever seen. He wore gold-rimmed pince-nez and had a curious impassivity of feature. It struck me that he might look natural on a stage, but was strangely out of place in real life. His voice was rather deep and unctuous. He placed a wooden hand in mine and said, Oh, this is a pleasure, Mr. Hastings. Then, turning to his wife, Emily, dearest, I think that cushion is a little damp. She beamed fondly on him as he substituted another with every demonstration of the tenderest care. Strange infatuation of an otherwise sensible woman. With the presence of Mr. Inglethorpe, a sense of constraint and veiled hostility seemed to settle down upon the company. Miss Howard, in particular, took no pains to conceal her feelings. Mrs. Inglethorpe, however, seemed to notice nothing unusual. Her volubility, which I remembered of old, had lost nothing in the intervening years, and she poured out a steady flood of conversation, mainly on the subject of the forthcoming bazaar which she was organising and which was to take place shortly. Occasionally she referred to her husband over a question of days or dates. His watchful and attentive manner never varied. From the very first I took a firm and rooted dislike to him and I flatter myself that my first judgments are usually fairly shrewd. Presently, Mrs. Inglethorpe turned to give some instructions about letters to Evelyn Howard, and her husband addressed me in his painstaking voice. Um, Is soldiering your regular profession, Mr. Hastings? Uh, No. Um, Before the war, I was in Lloyd's. And you will return there after it is over? Perhaps. "'Either that or a fresh start altogether.' "'Mary Cavendish leant forward. "'What would you really choose as a profession "'if you could just consult your inclination?' "'Well, uh, (laughs) that depends. "'No secret hobby?' she asked. "'Tell me, you're drawn to something? "'Everyone is. "'Usually something absurd.' "'Well, you'll laugh at me.' "'She smiled. "'Perhaps.' "'Well, I've always had a secret hankering to be a detective. "'The real thing? Scotland Yard? Or Sherlock Holmes?' "'Oh, Sherlock Holmes, by all means. "'No, but but really, seriously, I'm, I, I'm awfully drawn to it. "'I came across a man in Belgium once, a very famous detective, "'and he quite inflamed me. "'He was a marvellous little fellow. "'He used to say that all good detective work was a mere matter of method.' My system is based on his, though, of course, I've progressed rather further. He was a funny little man, a great dandy, but wonderfully clever. Well, like a good detective story myself, remarked Miss Howard. Lots of nonsense written, though. Criminal discovered in last chapter, everyone dumbfounded, real crime you'd know at once. Well, there have been a great number of undiscovered crimes, I argued. No, no, don't mean the police, but the people that are right in it, the family. "'You couldn't really hoodwink them. They'd know.' "'Well, then,' I said, much amused, "'you think that if you were mixed up in a crime, say a murder, "'you'd be able to spot the murderer right off?' (laughs) "'Of course I should. "'Mightn't be able to prove it to a pack of lawyers, "'but I'm certain I'd know. "'I'd feel it in my fingertips if it came near me.' "'It might be a she,' I suggested. Mm, "'Might, but murder's a violent crime. "'Associate it more with a man.' "'Not in a case of poisoning.' "'Mrs. Cavendish's clear voice startled me. "'Dr. Bowerstein was saying yesterday "'that owing to the general ignorance "'of the more uncommon poisons among the medical profession, "'there were probably countless cases of poisoning "'quite unsuspected.' "'Why, Mary, what a gruesome conversation!' "'cried Mrs. Inglethorpe. "'It makes me feel as if a goose were walking over my grave. "'Oh, there's Cynthia!' A young girl in V.A.D. uniform ran lightly across the lawn. 
Why, Cynthia, you are late today. This is Mr. Hastings, Miss Murdoch. Cynthia Murdoch was a fresh-looking young creature, full of life and vigour. She tossed off her little V.A.D. cap, and I admired the great loose waves of her auburn hair and the smallness and whiteness of the hand she held out to claim her tea. With dark eyes and eyelashes, she would have been a beauty. She flung herself down on the ground beside John, and as I handed her a plate of sandwiches, she smiled up at me. "'Sit down here on the grass, do. It's ever so much nicer.' I dropped down obediently. "'You work at Tadminster, don't you, Miss Murdoch?' She nodded. Hmm? For my sins? Do they bully you, then? I asked, smiling. Ah, I should like to see them, cried Cynthia with dignity. I've got a cousin who is nursing, I remarked, and she is terrified of sisters. Oh, I don't wonder. Sisters are, you know, Mr. Hastings. They simply are. You've no idea. Oh, but I'm not a nurse, thank heaven. I work in the dispensary. <laughs> How many people do you poison? I asked, smiling. Cynthia smiled, too. "'Oh, hundreds,' she said. "'Cynthia,' called Mrs. Inglethorpe, "'do you think you could write a few notes for me?' "'Certainly, Aunt Emily.' She jumped up promptly, and something in her manner reminded me that her position was a dependent one, and that Mrs. Inglethorpe, kind as she might be in the main, did not allow her to forget it. My hostess turned to me. "'John will show you your room, and supper is at half-past seven. We've given up late dinner for some time now. Lady Tadminster, our member's wife, she was the late Lord Abbotsbury's daughter, does the same. She agreed with me that one must set an example of economy. We're quite a war household. Nothing is wasted here. Every scrap of waste paper even is saved and sent away in sacks. I expressed my appreciation, and John took me into the house and up the broad staircase, which forked right and left halfway to different wings of the building. My room was in the left wing, and looked out over the park. John left me, and a few minutes later I saw him from my window walking slowly across the grass arm in arm with Cynthia Murdoch. I heard Mrs. Inglethorpe call, Cynthia, impatiently, and the girl started and ran back to the house. At the same moment, a man stepped out from the shadow of a tree and walked slowly in the same direction. He looked about forty, very dark, with a melancholy, clean-shaven face. Some violent emotion seemed to be mastering him. He looked up at my window as he passed, and I recognised him, though he had changed much in the fifteen years that had elapsed since we last met. It was John's younger brother, Lawrence Cavendish. I wondered what it was that had brought that singular expression to his face. Then I dismissed him from my mind and returned to the contemplation of my own affairs. The evening passed pleasantly enough, and I dreamed that night of that enigmatical woman, Mary Cavendish. The next morning dawned bright and sunny, and I was full of the anticipation of a delightful visit. I did not see Mrs. Cavendish until lunchtime, when she volunteered to take me for a walk, and we spent a charming afternoon roaming in the woods, returning to the house about five. As we entered the large hall, John beckoned us both into the smoking room. I saw at once by his face that something disturbing had occurred. We followed him in, and he shut the door after us. Um, look here, Mary, there's the deuce of a mess. Evie's had a row with Alfred Inglethorpe, and she's off. Evie? Off? John nodded gloomily. Yes. You see, she went to the mater, and... Oh, here's Evie herself. Miss Howard entered. Her lips were set grimly together, and she carried a small suitcase. She looked excited and determined, and slightly on the defensive. "'At any rate,' she burst out, "'I've spoken my mind.' "'My dear Evelyn,' cried Mrs. Cavendish, "'this can't be true.' Miss Howard nodded grimly. Well, "'True enough. "'Afraid I said some things to Emily she won't forget or forgive in a hurry. "'Don't mind if they've only sunk in a bed. "'Probably water off a duck's back, though. "'I said right out, "'You're an old woman, Emily, and there's no fool like an old fool.' The man's twenty years younger than you, and don't you fool yourself as to what he married you for. Money! Well, don't let him have too much of it. Farmer Rakes has got a very pretty young wife. Just ask your Alfred how much time he spends over there. She was very angry. Natural, I went on. I'm going to warn you whether you like it or not. 
That man would as soon murder you in your bed as look at you. He's a bad lot. You can say what you like to me, but remember what I've told you. He's a bad lot. What did she say? Miss Howard made an extremely expressive grimace. Darling Alfred, dearest Alfred, wicked calumnies, wicked lies, wicked woman, to accuse her dear husband. The sooner I left her house, the better. So I'm off. But not now. This minute. For a moment we sat and stared at her. Finally, John Cavendish, finding his persuasions of no avail, went off to look up the trains. His wife followed him, murmuring something about persuading Mrs. Inglethorpe to think better of it. As she left the room, Miss Howard's face changed. She leant toward me eagerly. Mr. Hastings, you're honest. I can trust you. Well, I was a little startled. She laid her hand on my arm and sank her voice to a whisper. Look after her, Mr. Hastings, my poor Emily. There are a lot of sharks, all of them. Oh, I know what I'm talking about. There isn't one of them that's not hard up and trying to get money out of her. I've protected her as much as I could, and now I'm out of the way. They'll impose upon her. Of course, Miss Howard, I said. I'll do everything I can, but I'm sure you're excited and overwrought. She interrupted me by slowly shaking her forefinger. Young man, trust me, I've lived in the world rather longer than you have. All I ask you is. The sinister face of Doctor Bowerstein recurred to me unpleasantly. A vague suspicion of everyone and everything. Filled my mind. Just for a moment, I had a premonition of approaching evil. Chapter two, the sixteenth and seventeenth of July. I had arrived at Styles on the fifth of July. I come now to the events of the sixteenth and seventeenth of that month. For the convenience of the reader, I will recapitulate the incidents of those days in exact a manner as possible. They were elicited subsequently at the trial by a process of long and tedious cross-examinations. I received a letter from Evelyn Howard a couple of days after her departure, telling me that she was working as a nurse at the big hospital in Middlingham, a manufacturing town some fifteen miles away, and begging me to let her know if Mrs. Inglethorpe should show any wish to be reconciled. The only fly in the ointment of my peaceful days was Mrs. Cavendish's extraordinary, and for my part unaccountable preference for the society of Doctor Bowerstein. What she saw in the man, I cannot imagine, but she was always asking him up to the house, and often went off for long expeditions with him. I, I must confess that I was quite unable to see his attraction. The sixteenth of July fell on a Monday. It was a day of turmoil. The famous bazaar had taken place on Saturday, and an entertainment in connection with the same charity at which Mrs. Inglethorpe was to recite a war poem was to be held that night. We were all busy during the morning arranging and decorating the hall in the village where it was to take place. We had a late luncheon and spent the afternoon resting in the garden. I noticed that John's manner was somewhat unusual. He seemed very excited and restless. After tea, Mrs. Inglethorpe went to lie down to rest before her efforts in the evening, and I challenged Mary Cavendish to a single at tennis. About a quarter to seven, Mrs. Inglethorpe called to us that we should be late, as supper was early that night. We had rather a scramble to get ready in time, and before the meal was over, the motor was waiting at the door. The entertainment was a great success. Mrs. Inglethorpe's recitation receiving tremendous applause. There were also some tableaux in which Cynthia took part. She did not return with us, having been asked to a supper party, and to remain the night with some friends who had been acting with her in the tableau. The following morning, Mrs. Inglethorpe stayed in bed to breakfast, as she was rather overtired. But she appeared in her briskest mood about twelve thirty, and swept Lawrence and myself off to a luncheon party. Such a charming invitation from Mrs. Rolleston, Lady Tadminster's sister, you know. The Rolestons came over with the Conqueror, one of our oldest families. Mary had excused herself on the plea of an engagement with Doctor Bowerstein. We had a pleasant luncheon, and as we drove away. Lawrence suggested that we should return by Tadminster, which was barely a mile out of our way, and pay a visit to Cynthia in her dispensary. Mrs. Inglethorpe replied that this was an excellent idea, but as she had several letters to write, she would drop us there, and we would come back with Cynthia in the pony trap. We were detained under suspicion by the hospital porter until Cynthia appeared to vouch for us, looking very cool and sweet in her long white overall. 
She took us up to her sanctum and introduced us to her fellow dispenser, a rather awe-inspiring individual whom Cynthia cheerily addressed as Nibs. "'What a lot of bottles!' I exclaimed as my eye travelled round the small room. "'Do you really know what's in them all?' "'Oh, say something original,' groaned Cynthia. "'Every single person who comes up here says that. "'We're really thinking of bestowing a prize on the first individual who does not say, "'What a lot of bottles!' And I know the next thing you're going to say is, How many people have you poisoned? I pleaded guilty with a laugh. If you people only knew how fatally easy it is to poison someone by mistake, you wouldn't joke about it. Come on, let's have tea. We've got all sorts of secret stores in that cupboard. Uh, no, Lawrence, that's the poison cupboard. The big cupboard. That's right. We had a very cheery tea and assisted Cynthia to wash up afterwards. We had just put away the last teaspoon when a knock came at the door. The countenances of Cynthia and Nibs were suddenly petrified into a stern and forbidding expression. "'Come in,' said Cynthia, in a sharp professional tone. A young and rather scared-looking nurse appeared with a bottle which she proffered to Nibs, who waved it towards Cynthia with the somewhat enigmatical remark, uh, "'I'm not really here today.' Cynthia took the bottle and examined it with the severity of a judge. "'But this should have been sent up this morning.' Um, sister's very sorry, she forgot. Sister should read the rules outside the door. I gathered from the little nurse's expression that there was not the least likelihood of her having the hardihood to retail this message to the dreaded sister. So now it can't be done until tomorrow, finished Cynthia. Oh, don't you think you could possibly let us have it tonight? Well, said Cynthia graciously, we are very busy, but if we have time it shall be done. The little nurse withdrew, and Cynthia promptly took a jar from the shelf, refilled the bottle, and placed it on the table outside the door. I laughed. Discipline must be maintained. Exactly. Come out on our little balcony. You can see all the outside wards there. I followed Cynthia and her friend, and they pointed out the different wards to me. Lawrence remained behind, but after a few moments Cynthia called to him over her shoulder to come and join us. Then she looked at her watch. Uh, nothing more to do, Nibs? Uh, no. All right, then we can lock up and go. I had seen Lawrence in quite a different light that afternoon. Compared to John, he was an astoundingly difficult person to get to know. He was the opposite of his brother in almost every respect, being unusually shy and reserved. Yet he had a certain charm of manner, and I fancied that if one really knew him well, one could have a deep affection for him. I had always fancied that his manner to Cynthia was rather constrained, and that she on her side was inclined to be shy of him, but they were both gay enough this afternoon and chatted together like a couple of children. As we drove through the village, I remembered that I wanted some stamps, so accordingly we pulled up at the post office. As I came out again, I cannoned into a little man who was just entering. I drew aside and apologised when suddenly, with a loud exclamation, he clasped me in his arms and kissed me warmly. "'Mon ami Hastings!' he cried. "'It is indeed! Mon ami Hastings!' "'Poirot!' I exclaimed. I turned to the pony trap. "'This is a very pleasant meeting for me, Miss Cynthia. This is my old friend, Monsieur Poirot, whom I have not seen for years.' "'Oh, we know Monsieur Poirot,' said Cynthia gaily. "'But I had no idea he was a friend of yours.' "'Oh, yes, indeed,' said Poirot seriously. "'I know Mademoiselle Cynthia. "'It is by the charity of that good Mrs. Ingersoll that I am here.' "'Then, as I looked at him inquiringly, "'Oh, yes, my friend. "'She had kindly extended hospitality to seven of my country people "'who, alas, are refugees from their native land. "'We Belgians will always remember her with gratitude.' Poirot was an extraordinary-looking little man. He was hardly more than five feet four inches, but carried himself with great dignity. His head was exactly the shape of an egg, and he always perched it a little on one side. His moustache was very stiff and military, and the neatness of his attire was almost incredible. I believe a speck of dust would have caused him more pain than a bullet wound." Yet this quaint, dandified little man, who I was sorry to see now limped badly, had been, in his time, one of the most celebrated members of the Belgian police. 
As a detective, his flair had been extraordinary, and he had achieved triumphs by unravelling some of the most baffling cases of the day. He pointed out to me the little house inhabited by him and his fellow Belgians, and I promised to go and see him at an early date. Then he raised his hat with a flourish to Cynthia, and we drove away. Oh, he's a dear little man, said Cynthia. I'd no idea you knew him. Oh, you've been entertaining a celebrity unawares, I replied. And for the rest of the way home, I recited to them the various exploits and triumphs of Hercule Poirot. We arrived back in a very cheerful mood. As we entered the hall, Mrs. Inglethorpe came out of her boudoir. She looked flushed and upset. Oh, it's you, she said. Is there anything the matter, Aunt Emily? asked Cynthia. Certainly not, said Mrs. Inglethorpe sharply. What should there be? Then, catching sight of Dorcas, the parlour maid, going into the dining room, she called to her to bring some stamps into the boudoir.、Uh, yes, ma'am. The old servant hesitated, then added diffidently,、uh, "Don't you think, ma'am, you'd better get to bed? You're looking very tired."、Uh, perhaps you're right, Dorcas. Yes. No, no, not now. I have some letters I must finish by post time. Have you lighted the fire in my room as I told you? Yes, ma'am. Then I'll go to bed directly after supper. She went into the boudoir again, and Cynthia stared after her. Goodness gracious! I wonder what's up," she said to Lawrence. He did not seem to have heard her, for without a word he turned on his heel and went out of the house. I suggested a quick game of tennis before supper, and Cynthia agreeing, I ran upstairs to fetch my racket. Mrs. Cavendish was coming down the stairs. It may have been my fancy, but she too was looking odd and disturbed. Had a good walk with Doctor Barstein? I asked, trying to appear as indifferent as I could. I didn't go," she replied abruptly.、Um, "Where is Mrs. Inglethorpe? In the boudoir." Her hand clenched itself on the banisters. Then she seemed to nerve herself for some encounter, and went rapidly past me down the stairs, across the hall to the boudoir, the door of which she shut behind her. As I ran out to the tennis court a few moments later, I had to pass the open boudoir window, and was unable to help overhearing the following scrap of dialogue. Mary Cavendish was saying, in the voice of a woman desperately controlling herself, "Then, you won't show it to me." To which Mrs. Inglethorpe replied, "My dear Mary, it has nothing to do with that matter." Then show it to me. I tell you, it's not what you imagine. It does not concern you in the least. To which Mary Cavendish replied, with a rising bitterness, "Of course, I might have known you would shield him." Cynthia was waiting for me and greeted me eagerly with, "I say, there's been the most awful row. I've got it all out of Dorcas." "What kind of a row?" "Between Aunt Emily and him." "Oh, I do hope she's found him out at last." "Was Dorcas there then?" "Of course not. She happened to be near the door. It was a real old bust-up. I do wish I knew what it was all about." I thought of Mrs. Rake's gipsy face and Evelyn Howard's warnings, but wisely decided to hold my peace. While Cynthia exhausted every possible hypothesis and cheerfully hoped, Aunt Emily will send him away and will never speak to him again. I was anxious to get hold of John, but he was nowhere to be seen. Evidently, something very momentous had occurred that afternoon. I tried to forget the few words I had overheard, but do what I could, I could not dismiss them altogether from my mind. What was Mary Cavendish's concern in the matter? Mr. Inglethorpe was in the drawing room when I came down to supper. His face was impassive as ever, and the strange unreality of the man struck me afresh. Mrs. Inglethorpe came down last. She still looked agitated, and during the meal there was a somewhat constrained silence. Inglethorpe was unusually quiet. As a rule, he surrounded his wife with little attentions, placing a cushion at her back, and altogether playing the part of the devoted husband. Immediately after supper. Mrs. Inglethorpe retired to her boudoir again.、Uh, "Send my coffee in here, Mary," she called. "I have just five minutes to catch the post." Cynthia and I went and sat by the open window in the drawing room. Mary Cavendish brought our coffee to us. She seemed excited. 
Do you young people want lights, or do you enjoy the twilight? she asked. Will you take Mrs. Inglethorpe her coffee, Cynthia? I will pour it out. Uh, do not trouble, Mary, said Inglethorpe. I will take it to Emily. He poured it out and went out of the room carrying it carefully. Lawrence followed him, and Mrs. Cavendish sat down by us. We three sat for some time in silence. It was a glorious night, hot and still. Mrs. Cavendish fanned herself gently with a palm leaf. Oh, it's almost too hot, she murmured. We shall have a thunderstorm. Alas, that these harmonious moments can never endure. My paradise was rudely shattered by the sound of a well-known and heartily disliked voice in the hall. Dr. Bowerstein, exclaimed Cynthia. What a funny time to come! I glanced jealously at Mary Cavendish, but she seemed quite undisturbed. The delicate pallor of her cheeks did not vary. In a few moments, Alfred Inglethorpe had ushered the doctor in, the latter laughing and protesting that he was in no fit state for a drawing-room. In truth, he presented a sorry spectacle, being literally plastered with mud. "'What have you been doing, doctor?' cried Mrs. Cavendish. "'I must make my apologies,' said the doctor. "'I did not really mean to come in, but Mr. Inglethorpe insisted.' "'Well, Bastine, you are in a plight,' said John, strolling in from the hall. "'Have some coffee and tell us what you've been up to.' "'Thank you. I will.' He laughed rather ruefully as he described how he had discovered a very rare species of fern in an inaccessible place, and in his efforts to obtain it had lost his footing and slipped ignominiously into a neighbouring pond. "'The sun soon dried me off,' he added, "'but I'm afraid my appearance is very disreputable.' At this juncture, Mrs. Inglethorpe called to Cynthia from the hall, and the girl ran out. Uh, "'Just carry up my dispatch case, will you, dear? I'm going to bed.' The door into the hall was a wide one. I had risen when Cynthia did. John was close by me. There were therefore three witnesses who could swear that Mrs. Inglethorpe was carrying her coffee, as yet untasted, in her hand. My evening was utterly and entirely spoilt by the presence of Dr. Bowerstein. It seemed to me the man would never go. He rose at last, however, and I breathed a sigh of relief. "'I'll walk down to the village with you,' said Mr. Inglethorpe. "'I must see our agent over those estate accounts.' He turned to John. "'No one needs it up. I will take the latch-key.' Chapter 3 The Night of the Tragedy to make this part of my story clear, I would ask you to have a look at the plan of the first floor of Styles, a copy of which I have provided to accompany my tale. As you will see, the servants' rooms are reached through the door B. They have no communication with the right wing, where the Inglethorpe's rooms were situated. It seemed to be the middle of the night when I was awakened by Lawrence Cavendish. He had a candle in his hand, and the agitation of his face told me at once that something was seriously wrong. "'What's the matter?' I asked, sitting up in bed and trying to collect my scattered thoughts. Oh, "'We are afraid my mother is very ill. She seems to be having some kind of fit. Unfortunately, she has locked herself in. Well, "'I'll come at once.' I sprang out of bed, and, pulling on a dressing gown, followed Lawrence along the passage in the gallery to the right wing of the house. John Cavendish joined us, and one or two of the servants were standing around in a state of awe-stricken excitement. Lawrence turned to his brother. Um, what do you think we had better do? Never, I thought, had his indecision of character been more apparent. John rattled the handle of Mrs. Inglethorpe's door violently, but with no effect. It was obviously locked or bolted on the inside. The whole household was aroused by now. The most alarming sounds were audible from the interior of the room. Clearly, something must be done. Uh, "'Try going through Mr. Inglethorpe's room, sir,' cried Dorcas. "'Oh, the poor mistress!' Suddenly I realised that Alfred Inglethorpe was not with us, that he alone had given no sign of his presence. John opened the door of his room. It was pitch dark. But Lawrence was following with the candle, and by its feeble light we saw that the bed had not been slept in. 
and that there was no sign of the room having been occupied. We went straight to the connecting door. That too was locked or bolted on the inside. What was to be done? Oh, dear sir, cried Dorcas, wringing her hands. Whatever shall we do? Well, we must try and break the door in, I suppose. It'll be a tough job, though. Here, let one of the maids go down and wake Bailey and tell him to go for Dr. Wilkins at once. Now then, we'll have a try at the door. Uh, half a moment, though. Isn't there a door into Miss Cynthia's room? Uh, yes, sir, but that's always bolted. It's never been undone. Well, we might just see. He ran rapidly down the corridor to Cynthia's room. Mary Cavendish was there, shaking the girl, who must have been an unusually sound sleeper, and trying to wake her. In a moment or two, he was back. No good. That's bolted too. We must break in the door. I think this one is a shade less solid than the one in the passage. We strained and heaved together. The framework of the door was solid, and for a long time it resisted our efforts. But at last we felt it give beneath our weight, and finally, with a resounding crash, it was burst open. We stumbled in together, Lawrence still holding his candle. Mrs. Inglethorpe was lying on the bed, her whole form agitated by violent convulsions, in one of which she must have overturned the table beside her. As we entered, however, her limbs relaxed, and she fell back upon the pillows. John strode across the room and lit the gas. Turning to Annie, one of the housemaids, he sent her downstairs to the dining room for brandy. Then he went across to his mother, whilst I unbolted the door that gave on the corridor. I turned to Lawrence to suggest that I had better leave them now that there was no further need of my services, but the words were frozen on my lips. Never have I seen such a ghastly look on any man's face. He was white as chalk. The candle he held in his shaking hand was sputtering onto the carpet, and his eyes, petrified with terror, or some such kindred emotion, stared fixedly over my head at a point on the further wall. It was as though he had seen something that turned him to stone. I instinctively followed the direction of his eyes, but I could see nothing unusual. The still feebly flickering ashes in the grate, and the row of prim ornaments on the mantelpiece were surely harmless enough. The violence of Mrs. Inglethorpe's attack seemed to be passing. She was able to speak in short gasps. <laughs> Better now. <laughs> Very sudden. <laughs> Stupid of me <laughs> to lock myself in. A shadow fell on the bed, and looking up, I saw Mary Cavendish standing near the door with her arm round Cynthia. She seemed to be supporting the girl, who looked utterly dazed and unlike herself. Her face was heavily flushed, and she yawned repeatedly. Poor Cynthia is quite frightened," said Mrs. Cavendish in a low, clear voice. She herself, I noticed, was dressed in her white land smock. Then it must be later than I thought. I saw that a faint streak of daylight was showing through the curtains of the windows, and that the clock on the mantelpiece pointed to close upon five o'clock. A strangled cry from the bed startled me. A fresh access of pain seized the unfortunate old lady. The convulsions were of a violence terrible to behold. Everything was confusion. We thronged round her, powerless to help or alleviate. A final convulsion lifted her from the bed until she appeared to rest upon her head and her heels, with her body arched in an extraordinary manner. In vain, Mary and John tried to administer more brandy. The moments flew. Again, the body arched itself in that peculiar fashion. At that moment, Doctor Bowerstein pushed his way authoritatively into the room. For one instant, he stopped dead, staring at the figure on the bed, and at the same instant, Missus Inglethorpe cried out in a strangled voice, her eyes fixed on the doctor. Alfred, Alfred. Then she fell back motionless on the pillows. With a stride, the doctor reached the bed and, seizing her arms, worked them energetically, applying what I knew to be artificial respiration. He issued a few short, sharp orders to the servants. An imperious wave of his hand drove us all to the door. We watched him, fascinated, though I think we all knew in our hearts that it was too late and that nothing could be done now.
I could see by the expression on his face that he himself had little hope. Finally, he abandoned his task, shaking his head gravely. At that moment, we heard footsteps outside, and Dr. Wilkins, Mrs. Inglethorpe's own doctor, a portly, fussy little man, came bustling in. In a few words, Dr. Bowerstein explained how he had happened to be passing the lodge gates as the car came out, and had run up to the house as fast as he could whilst the car went on to fetch Dr. Wilkins. With a faint gesture of the hand, he indicated the figure on the bed. Oh, very sad, very sad, murmured Dr. Wilkins. Poor dear lady, always did far too much, far too much, against my advice. I warned her, her heart was far from strong. Take it easy, I said to her, take it easy. But no, her zeal for good works was too great. Nature rebelled, nature rebelled. Dr. Bowerstein, I noticed, was watching the local doctor narrowly. He still kept his eyes fixed on him as he spoke. The convulsions were of a peculiar violence, Dr. Wilkins. I am sorry you were not here in time to witness them. They were quite titanic in character. Ah, said Dr. Wilkins wisely. I should like to speak to you in private, said Dr. Bowerstein. He turned to John. You do not object? Certainly not. We all trooped out into the corridor, leaving the two doctors alone, and I heard the key turned in the lock behind us. We went slowly down the stairs. I was violently excited. I have a certain talent for deduction, and Dr. Bowerstein's manner had started a flock of wild surmises in my mind. Mary Cavendish laid her hand upon my arm. What is it? Why did Dr. Bowerstein seem so peculiar? I looked at her. Do you know what I think? What? Listen. I looked round. The others were out of earshot. I lowered my voice to a whisper. I believe she has been poisoned. I'm certain Dr. Bowerstein suspects it. What? She shrank against the wall, the pupils of her eyes dilating wildly. Then, with a sudden cry that startled me, she cried out, No! No! Not that! Not that! And breaking from me, fled up the stairs. I followed her, afraid that she was going to faint. I found her leaning against the banisters, deadly pale. She waved me away impatiently. No, no! Leave me! I'd rather be alone. Let me just be quiet for a moment or two. Go down to the others. I obeyed her reluctantly. John and Lawrence were in the dining room. I joined them. We were all silent, but I suppose I voiced the thoughts of us all when I at last broke it by saying, Where is Mr. Inglethorpe? John shook his head. He's not in the house. Our eyes met. Where was Alfred Inglethorpe? His absence was strange and inexplicable. I remembered Mrs. Inglethorpe's dying words. What lay beneath them? What more could she have told us if she had had time? At last we heard the doctors descending the stairs. Dr. Wilkins was looking important and excited, and trying to conceal an inward exultation under a manner of decorous calm. Dr. Bowerstein remained in the background, his grave, bearded face unchanged. Dr. Wilkins was the spokesman for the two. He addressed himself to John. Uh, Mr. Cavendish, I should like your consent to a post-mortem. Is that necessary? asked John gravely. A spasm of pain crossed his face. Absolutely, said Dr. Bowerstein. You mean by that uh, that neither Dr. Wilkins nor myself could give a death certificate under the circumstances? John bent his head. But in, in that case, I, I have no alternative but to agree. Uh, thank you, said Dr. Wilkins briskly. We propose that it should take place tomorrow night, or rather, tonight. And he glanced at the daylight. Under the circumstances, I, I'm afraid an inquest can hardly be avoided. These formalities are necessary, but I beg that you won't distress yourselves. There was a pause, and then Dr. Bowerstein drew two keys from his pocket and handed them to John. 
These are the keys of the two rooms. I have locked them, and, in my opinion, they would be better kept locked for the present. The doctors then departed. I had been turning over an idea in my head, and I felt that the moment had now come to broach it. Yet I was a little chary of doing so. John, I knew, had a horror of any kind of publicity and was an easy-going optimist who preferred never to meet trouble halfway. It might be difficult to convince him of the soundness of my plan. Lawrence, on the other hand, being less conventional and having more imagination, I felt I might count upon as an ally. There was no doubt that the moment had come for me to take the lead. John, I said, I'm going to ask you something. Well, you remember my speaking of my friend Poirot, the Belgian who is here. Uh, he has been a most famous detective. Yes. I want you to let me call him in, to investigate this matter. What? Now? Before the post-mortem? Yes. Time is an advantage if... if there has been foul play. Rubbish! cried Lawrence angrily. In my opinion, the whole thing is a mare's nest of Bowstein's. Wilkins hadn't an idea of such a thing until Bowstein put it into his head. But like all specialists, Bowstein's got a bee in his bonnet. Poisons are his hobby, so of course he sees them everywhere. I confess that I was surprised by Lawrence's attitude. He was so seldom vehement about anything. John hesitated. I can't feel as you do, Lawrence, he said at last. I'm inclined to give Hastings a free hand though I should prefer to wait a bit. We don't want any unnecessary scandal. Oh, no, no, I cried eagerly. You need have no fear of that. Poirot is discretion itself. Well, very well, then. Have it your own way. I leave it in your hands, though, if it is as we suspect, it seems a clear enough case. God forgive me if I'm wronging him. I looked at my watch. It was six o'clock. I determined to lose no time. Five minutes' delay, however, I allowed myself. I spent it in ransacking the library until I discovered a medical book which gave a description of strychnine poisoning. Chapter 4 Poirot Investigates The house which the Belgians occupied in the village was quite close to the park gates. One could save time by taking a narrow path through the long grass which cut off the detours of the winding drive, so I accordingly went that way. I had nearly reached the lodge when my attention was arrested by the running figure of a man approaching me. It was Mr. Inglethorpe. Where had he been? How did he intend to explain his absence? He accosted me eagerly. <sighs> my God, this is terrible. Oh, my poor wife, I have only just heard. Where have you been? I asked. Oh, Denby kept me late last night. It was one o'clock before we'd finished, and then I found that I'd forgotten the latch key after all. I didn't want to arouse the household, so Denby gave me a bed. How did you hear the news? I asked. Oh, Wilkins knocked Denby up to tell him. Oh, my poor Emily. She was so self-sacrificing, such a noble character. She overtaxed her strength. A wave of revulsion swept over me. What a consummate hypocrite the man was. I must hurry on, I said, thankful that he did not ask me whither I was bound. In a few minutes, I was knocking at the door of Leastway's cottage. Getting no answer, I repeated my summons impatiently. A window above me was cautiously opened, and Poirot himself looked out. He gave an exclamation of surprise at seeing me. In a few brief words, I explained the tragedy that had occurred, and that I wanted his help. Wait, my friend, I will let you in, and you shall recount to me the affair whilst I dress. In a few moments he had unbarred the door, and I followed him up to his room. There he installed me in a chair, and I related the whole story, keeping back nothing, and omitting no circumstance, however insignificant, whilst he himself made a careful and deliberate toilet. I told him of my awakening, of Mrs. Inglethorpe's dying words, of her husband's absence, of the quarrel the day before, of the scrap of conversation between Mary and her mother-in-law that I had overheard, of the former quarrel between Mrs. Inglethorpe and Evelyn Howard, and of the latter's innuendos. I was hardly as clear as I could wish—
I repeated myself several times, and occasionally had to go back to some detail that I had forgotten. Poirot smiled kindly on me. Ah, the mind is confused. Is it not so? Take time, mon ami. You are agitated. You are excited. It is but natural. Presently, when we are calmer, we will arrange the facts neatly, each in his proper place. We will examine and reject. Those of importance we will put on one side, those of no importance. Poof! He screwed up his cherub like face and puffed comically enough. Blow them away. Well, that's all very well, I objected. But how are you going to decide what is important and what isn't? That always seems the difficulty to me. Poirot shook his head energetically. He was now arranging his moustache with exquisite care. Oh, not so. Voyons. One fact leads to another. And so we continue. Does the next fit in with that? A ah, merveille. Good. We can proceed. This next little fact? No. Ah, that is curious. There is something missing, a link in the chain that is not there. Or we examine, we search, and that little curious fact, that possible paltry little detail that will not tally, we put it here. He made an extravagant gesture with his hand. It is significant. It is tremendous. Uh, yes. Ah! Poirot shook his forefinger so fiercely at me that I quailed before it. Beware! Peril to the detective who says, It is so small it does not matter. It will not agree. I will forget it. No, that way lies confusion. Everything matters. Why, no. You always told me that. That's why I've gone into all the details of this thing, whether they seem to me relevant or not. Well, and I am pleased with you. You have a good memory, and you have given me the facts faithfully. Of the order in which you present them, I say nothing. Truly, it is deplorable. But I make allowances. You are upset. To that, I attribute the circumstance that you have omitted one fact of paramount importance. Well, what's that? I asked. You have not told me if Mrs. Inglethorpe ate well last night. I stared at him. Surely the war had affected the little man's brain. He was carefully engaged in brushing his coat before putting it on and seemed wholly engrossed in the task. Why, I don't remember, I said. And anyway, I don't see... Oh, you do not see? But it is of the first importance. But I can't see why, I said rather nettled. As far as I can remember, uh, she didn't eat much. Uh, she was obviously upset and it had taken her appetite away. Well, that was only natural. Yes, said Poirot thoughtfully. It was only natural. He opened a drawer and took out a small dispatch case, then turned to me. Now I am ready. We will proceed to the chateau and study matters on the spot. Oh, excuse me, mon ami, you're dressed in haste and your tie is on one side. Permit me? With a deft gesture, he rearranged it. Say ye. Now, shall we start? We hurried up the village and turned in at the lodge gates. Poirot stopped for a moment and gazed sorrowfully over the beautiful expanse of park still glittering with morning dew. Ah, oh, so beautiful, so beautiful, and yet the poor family plunged in sorrow, prostrated with grief. He looked at me keenly as he spoke, and I was aware that I reddened under his prolonged gaze. Was the family prostrated by grief? Was the sorrow at Mrs. Inglethorpe's death so great? I realized that there was an emotional lack in the atmosphere. The dead woman had not the gift of commanding love. Her death was a shock and a distress, but she would not be passionately regretted. Poirot seemed to follow my thoughts. He nodded his head gravely. No, you are right, he said. It is not as though there was a blood tie. She has been kind and generous to these Cavendishes, but she was not their own mother. Blood tells. Always remember that. Blood tells. End of Disc 1